William Lamb, 2nd Viscount Melbourne. William Lamb, 2nd Viscount Melbourne, was a British Whig statesman who served as Home Secretary and Prime Minister. He is best known for his intense and successful mentoring of Queen Victoria in the ways of politics, when she was between the ages of 18 and 21. Historians have concluded that Melbourne does not rank highly as a Prime Minister, for there were no great foreign wars or domestic issues to handle, he lacked major achievements and he enunciated no grand principles. But he was kind, honest and not self-seeking. Melbourne was Prime Minister on two occasions. The first occasion ended when he was dismissed by King William IV in 1834, the last British Prime Minister to be dismissed by a monarch. Six months later he was reappointed and served for six years. Born in London in 1779 to an aristocratic Whig family, William Lamb was the son of the first Viscount Melbourne and Elizabeth, Viscountess Melbourne. However, his paternity was questioned, being attributed to George Wyndham, 3rd Earl of Egremont, to whom it was considered he bore a considerable resemblance, and at whose residence, Petworth, Lamb was a visitor until the Earl's death, he was called to his bedside when he was dying. Lamb nevertheless stated that Egremont being his father was all a lie. He was educated at Eton, Trinity College, Cambridge and the University of Glasgow. Against the background of the Napoleonic Wars, Lamb served at home as captain and major in the Hertfordshire Volunteer Infantry. He succeeded his elder brother as heir to his father's title in 1805, and married Lady Caroline Ponsonby, an Anglo-Irish aristocrat. The following year, he was elected to the British House of Commons as the Whig MP for Lempster. For the election in 1806 he moved to the seat of Haddington Burghs, and for the 1807 election he successfully stood for Port Arlington. Lamb first came to general notice for reasons he would rather have avoided, his wife had a public affair with Lord Byron, she coined the famous characterization of Byron as mad, bad and dangerous to know. The resulting scandal was the talk of Britain in 1812. Lady Caroline published a gothic novel, Glen Arvin, in 1816. This portrayed both the marriage and her affair with Byron in a lurid fashion, which caused William even greater embarrassment, while the spiteful caricatures of leading society figures made them several influential enemies. Eventually the two were reconciled, and, though they separated in 1825, her death in 1828 affected him considerably. In 1816, Lamb was returned for Peterborough by Whig grandee Lord Fitzwilliam. He told Lord Holland that he was committed to the Whig principles of the Glorious Revolution but not to a heap of modern additions, interpolations, facts and fictions. He therefore spoke against parliamentary reform, and voted for the suspension of habeas corpus in 1817 when sedition was rife. Lamb's hallmark was finding the middle ground. Though a Whig, he accepted the post of Chief Secretary for Ireland in the moderate Dory governments of George Canning and Lord Godrich. Upon the death of his father in 1828 and his becoming the second Viscount Melbourne, of Kilmore in the county of Cavan, he moved to the House of Lords. He had spent 25 years in the Commons, largely as a backbencher, and was not politically well known. In November 1830, the Whigs came to power under Lord Grey. Melbourne was Home Secretary. During the disturbances of 1830-32 he acted both vigorously and sensitively and it was for this function that his reforming brethren thanked him heartily. In the aftermath of the swing riots of 1830-31, he countered the Tory magistrate's alarmism by refusing to resort to military force, instead, he advocated magistrates' usual powers be fully enforced, along with special constables and financial rewards for the arrest of rioters and rabble-rousers. He appointed a special commission to try approximately 1,000 of those arrested, and ensured that justice was strictly adhered to. One third were acquitted and most of the one fifth sentenced to death were instead transported. There remains controversy regarding the hanging of Dick Pendarin, a protester in the Merthyr Rising who was then, and is now, widely judged to have been innocent. He appears to have been executed solely on the word of Melbourne, who sought a victim in order to set an example. The disturbances over reform in 1831 32 were countered with the enforcement of the usual laws. Again, Melbourne refused to pass emergency legislation against sedition. After Lord Grey resigned as Prime Minister in July 1834, the King was forced to appoint another Whig to replace him, as the Tories were not strong enough to support a government. Melbourne was the man most likely to be both acceptable to the King and hold the Whig party together. Melbourne hesitated after receiving from Grey the letter from the King requesting him to visit him to discuss the formation of a government. Melbourne thought he would not enjoy the extra work that accompanied the office of Premier. 
but he did not want to let his friends and party down. According to Charles Greville, Melbourne said to his secretary, Tom Young, I think it's a damn bore. I am in many minds as to what to do. Young replied, Why, damn it all, such a position was never held by any Greek or Roman, and if it only lasts three months, it will be worthwhile to have been Prime Minister of England. By God, that's true, Melbourne said, I'll go. Compromise was the key to many of Melbourne's actions. As an aristocrat, he had a vested interest in the status quo. He was opposed to the Reform Act 1832 proposed by the Whigs, arguing that Catholic emancipation had not ended in the tranquility expected of it, but reluctantly agreed that it was necessary to forestall the threat of revolution. Later he opposed the repeal of the Corn Laws, arguing not only that Catholic emancipation had failed, but also that the Reform Act had not improved the condition of the people. King William IV's opposition to the Whigs' reforming ways led him to dismiss Melbourne in November. He then gave the Tories under Sir Robert Peel an opportunity to form a government. Peel's failure to win a House of Commons majority in the resulting general election made it impossible for him to govern, and the Whigs returned to power under Melbourne that April. This was the last time a British monarch attempted to appoint a government against a parliamentary majority. The next year, Melbourne was once again involved in a sex scandal. This time he was the victim of attempted blackmail from the husband of a close friend, society beauty and author Caroline Norton. The husband demanded £1,400, and when he was turned down he accused Melbourne of having an affair with his wife. At this time such a scandal would be enough to derail a major politician, so it is a measure of the respect contemporaries had for his integrity that Melbourne's government did not fall. The King and the Duke of Wellington urged him to stay on as Prime Minister. After Norton failed in court, Melbourne was vindicated, but he did stop seeing Norton. Nonetheless, as historian Boyd Hilton concludes, it is irrefutable that Melbourne's personal life was problematic. Spanking sessions with aristocratic ladies were harmless, not so the whippings administered to orphan girls taken into his household as objects of charity. Melbourne was Prime Minister when Queen Victoria came to the throne. Barely 18, she was only just breaking free from the domineering influence of her mother the Duchess of Kent, and her mother's advisor, Sir John Conroy. Over the next four years Melbourne trained her in the art of politics, and the two became friends, Victoria was quoted as saying she considered him like a father, and Melbourne's son had died at a young age. Melbourne was given a private apartment at Windsor Castle, and unfounded rumors circulated for a time that Victoria would marry Melbourne, 40 years her senior. Tutoring Victoria was the climax of Melbourne's career. The Prime Minister spent four to five hours a day visiting and writing to her, and she responded with enthusiasm and grew in wisdom. On May 7, 1839, Melbourne announced his intention to resign. This led to the bedchamber crisis. Prospective Prime Minister Robert Peel requested that Victoria dismiss some of the wives and daughters of Whig MPs who made up her personal entourage, arguing that the monarch should avoid any hint of favoritism to a party out of power. The Queen refused to comply, supported by Melbourne although he was unaware that Peel had not requested the resignation of Old Queen's ladies as she had led him to believe, and hence, Peel refused to form a new government, and Melbourne was persuaded to stay on as Prime Minister. Melbourne left a considerable list of reforming legislation, which, although not as long as that of Lord Grey, is considered worthy nonetheless. Among his government's acts were a reduction in the number of capital offences, reforms of local government, and the reform of the poor laws. This restricted the terms on which the poor were allowed relief and established compulsory admission to workhouses for the impoverished. On February 25, 1841, Melbourne was admitted as a fellow of the Royal Society. Following a vote of no confidence initiated by Conservative MP John Stuart Wortley, Melbourne's government fell, and he resigned as Prime Minister on 30 August 1841. After Melbourne resigned permanently in August 1841, Victoria continued to write to him, but eventually the correspondence ceased as it was deemed to be inappropriate. It has been observed that Melbourne's role faded as Victoria increasingly relied on her new husband Prince Albert. The weekend, Melbourne survived a stroke 14 months after his departure from politics. In retirement, he lived at Brockett Hall, Hertfordshire. He died on November 24, 1848 at Brockett Hall and was buried at nearby St. Ethelreda's Church, Hatfield, Hertfordshire. On his death, his titles passed to his brother Frederick, as both of his children, a son, George Augustus Frederick and a premature daughter had predeceased him. Thanks for watching. 
Don't forget like the video and don't forget to subscribe.